Welcome to part one of Bridal Awareness, where I'm going to be talking about PCAs. PCAs are often treated as being very casual, and they can be provided that everything is done correctly, but equally there's a lot of things going on in a very short period of time. For the jumper, you are literally handing off the responsibility of your deployment to somebody else. This is a decision which shouldn't be taken lightly. It's very important that you trust this person, especially if the object is not very forgiving. For the actual person giving the PCA, you should be competent in your skills in order to do so and very confident depending on the scenario that you find yourself in. It's important to note from the outset of this video that my intention is not to have this as a standalone tutorial. Ideally, you have given or are currently giving PCAs to people and this video is just going to give you a little bit more to think about. If you have never given somebody a PCA and you choose to follow this video, please do so off an object that is forgiving and have somebody with you that's more experienced to oversee everything. In this video I will be going through a gear check because I feel like that's an important part about giving a PCA, but I will not be talking about things like pin tension and pin orientation. I will likely make a future video talking about those things specifically, but for now, if you do have any questions or concerns regarding those things, I recommend that you just follow the guidelines of the manufacturer of your rig. The golden rule, regardless of the kind of jump that you're going to do, is never gear up with your pilot chute outside of your rig. There's literally no reason to do this other than you just being lazy. It keeps killing people. It doesn't have to happen. If you're doing it, please stop. And I'm going to say that at the start of every video. Let's get into it. Let's pretend for a minute that this is a jumper standing with their back facing me. I'm going to go through the entire setup process from start to finish and explain what I'm thinking as I go. And then after that, we'll look at some live video examples. In a live situation, prior to arriving at this point, I'm going to have ensured that the jumper has geared up fully and correctly. Chest strap is closed, leg straps are around the legs and fully tight. There's no damage to the harness. They often put it on with a twist in the harness and there's nothing on their body that could potentially become uh, a snag hazard. The first thing I'm going to do is communicate with the jumper that I'm going to open their pin flap and give them a pin check. From here forward, communication with the jumper is paramount because you don't want them to just suddenly start walking off as you're starting to pull on stuff behind them. I'm going to open the pin flap and for here, just to make the visual easier, I'm going to tuck this out of the way. I don't normally do that, but it'll be easier for you guys to see. The first thing I'm going to do is check where the bridle is coming from inside the rig. On this rig, it's coming out in between the two pins. There used to be some manufacturers that recommended you route the bridle out the top above the pins. It's all based on manufacturer's recommendation. The majority of people are saying in between the pins is good right now. The main thing that I'm concerned about is seeing that the bridle is not coming out through the shoulder or one of the bottom corners or just somewhere it's not supposed to be coming from. As I perform the pin check, I'm basically just going to follow where the bridle is coming from outside of the rig and then trace it all the way down, hopefully finishing at the BOC without encountering any misrouting or hangups. So in this case, the bridle is coming out the middle and I'll take the top pin and just floss it back and forth a little bit, seeing that it moves freely. Ensure that there's some slack in between the two pins. I'll floss the bottom pin back and forth a little bit as well. And personally, I like to actually take the bridle out of the channel at the bottom and just ensure that there is a clear path from the bottom pin all the way down to the BOC. Misrouting in relation to this has caused a couple of fatalities. There's been other videos made about these, which I won't go into too much detail right now. We will talk about that in the stowed video, but for now, I'll just leave the links to those videos in the description and you can check them out. Once I've done that, I'll tell the jumper, pins look good, I'm going to take your pilot chute. Now they know that the bridle is coming out and there is a, a much higher chance of their pins getting popped early when I actually start putting tension on it. When I take the pilot chute out, I like to put a little bit of pressure on the bottom pin so I don't accidentally pop it. And then remove it from the BOC. Depending where I'm at, sometimes I'll just throw the pilot chute on the ground. If I'm somewhere where there's a lot of stuff on the ground that I'm worried about could that could potentially damage the pilot chute, 
I might put it between my knees or if it's windy or anything like that. So for now, I'm just gonna throw it on the ground. Some people like to leave some bridle in the channel here to allow for a little bit of extra slack. Personally, I like to take it out. So then I can clearly see that from the bottom pin all the way down to the end of the pilot chute, there's no snags, there's no misrouting, everything is nice and clean. Now I'm gonna set everything up. I like to grab the bridle right at the bottom pin and then run my hand all the way back to my opposite shoulder so it's a little bit longer than arm's length. And that point is going to be where the first fold will go into my hand. When I make the folds, I'm gonna ensure that everything is coming out the bottom of my hand and there's nothing on top. If you have these loops coming out the top, you could accidentally get your fingers caught. And from here forward, as well as making sure everything works for the actual jumper, you're also concerned with making sure that nothing is gonna get snagged on yourself. From here, I'm gonna do two or three folds into my hand, leaving everything running out of the bottom. Some people will do lots of little folds in this case. Personally, I think that the more folds you have in your hand, the more open your hand is going to be and that's going to make it more difficult to actually hold on. I like to have the folds around the center of my palm and when I wrap my fingers around I use my fingertips to actually push the bridle against my palm and hold it in place. If you're in the habit of holding it up here when you wrap your fingers around you run the risk of burning your fingers as the bridle gets pulled out. Then I like to leave a decent amount of space on the back end which I'll explain why in a second. Once I get here, I'll give a couple of fluffs of the pilot chute just to make sure it's gonna work. And then I will flip the pilot chute around and grab it right at the center of the top surface. Different pilot chutes will have different things going on here. Some have patch handles, some will have a vent, some will be just like this where it's just ZP with the tapes covering. When I grab this, it's just gonna be a very soft grip, nice and light and then I have everything pretty much ready to go. The next thing I'm gonna do is tell the jumper that I'm ready, and then as they approach the exit point, I am essentially just acting as their shadow. My goal is to keep all the bridle away from their legs and arms as they're climbing over something, climbing under something, or walking to the edge of a cliff. When the jumper gets into position, I'm going to do the best I can to get my hands centered with their pins. That's gonna help us get a clean extraction and the best chance of giving us an on heading. And then the pilot chute is just going to be staged back behind it. So in order, it'll be jumper, bridle, pilot chute. When the jumper is actually in position about to exit, I'll give one final check to make sure that everything is clear behind them and let them know, and then it's on them. I do like people to give a good loud count when I'm holding all of their stuff, so I'm prepared. When the jumper exits, all of the work is essentially being done by the hand that's holding the bridle. In an ideal scenario, person exits, the pins will pop once the bridle takes tension, canopy will get pulled out, and when the jumper hits line stretch, the bridle will be ripped from my hand and I can just let go of the pilot chute. That's the reason why we have a little bit of slack here between the pilot chute and the loops in your hand. If I was to do all of these loops right up to the pilot chute and be holding it in some fashion like this, the bridle and the pilot chute will get ripped out of my hand at the same time. So that's giving me two opportunities to get the parachute out. If for some reason I accidentally let go of the bridle early, I can still use the pilot chute to extract the canopy and it's just giving me a little bit of leeway. So technically this is actually a bridle assist versus a pilot chute assist. There are some people that will use the actual pilot chute. So when the jumper exits, they'll just let go of the bridle and then use the pilot chute to pop the pins and pull the canopy out. My main problem with this, it's got nothing to do with the difference in opening altitude because it's just a couple of feet, but the amount of force that the jumper is going to have when they hit the bottom of the lines is going to rip this pilot chute out of your hand. It's very difficult to use just your eyes to time that to try to let go of it early, but I've seen lots of pilot chutes get damaged as a result of this method. Sometimes I've seen people hold it like this and they'll actually have the cap coming out. Caps have been ripped off. I've seen people's fingernails actually slice through the ZP from them holding onto it too tight. Uh, this vent has been ripped also. I've actually lost two pilot chutes personally, $200 plus pilot chutes as a result of the person who was giving me the PCA was holding it wrong. Another method you'll see is somebody holding 
the pilot chute like this. So this would seem kind of like a good idea. When it gets pulled, it just gets popped straight out of your hand. But the problem with holding onto the mesh is mesh is full of holes. If you're gonna use that, there is a chance that your fingers could get caught in it. If you're wearing a ring or a watch or have something else, it's just creating another thing to go wrong. It's very similar to the concept behind a static line. On a static line, we don't tie off to the pilot chute. We tie off to a loop inside the bridle and then the pilot chute is just there as a backup in case something happens to the bridle. It's the exact same concept applied here. As I said earlier, ideally everything is stacked in terms of jumper, bridle, pilot chute, but depending where your hand position ends up being is going to vary depending on the object. There are some objects where you might have to hold everything up super high in order to avoid everything. Others, you can rest your arm on stuff and lean over. On cliffs, for example, that are quite exposed, you might have to get your feet quite close to the edge. You're leaning back when the jumper is exiting and then doing a little bit of weight shift forward. Little things like this can take a lot of practice and it is a skill that needs to be developed and practiced in order to become competent at it. I highly recommend that when you first start learning this, you do it somewhere safe with a lot of margin, like the bridge here in Twin Falls. And if you are going to be getting PCA'd by somebody off an object that doesn't have a lot of margin, it's a really good idea to use a big pilot chute just in case something happens that puts you in free fall unintentionally and you need your parachute to come out quickly. All right, so I know that that's all pretty long-winded. In a live scenario, all of this happens in the course of a couple of seconds, which we're going to watch now. I'll show you a couple of examples of one on a bridge and one on a cliff. There's a lot of background noise in this shot, so I'm just going to do a voiceover and talk through what's happening. At this point, I had just checked her on her front and told her I was headed to the back to start the pin check. I open her flap, and then as I'm going through it, I'm communicating with her what I'm looking at, just so that she has peace of mind that everything is good. Following checking the channel, I take the pilot chute out, run back to my opposite shoulder, and put the S-folds into my hand. I'm going to give the pilot chute a couple of fluffs, and then light grip on the cap at the top, and have a look to make sure that everything is good. Following that, I tell her I'm ready, and then I start to shadow her movements, making sure that nothing is getting in the way. As she climbs over the rail, I'm going to lift the bridle up to make sure that there's no chance of her leg accidentally kicking it, and I just hold the pilot chute back. As soon as she gets over the rail, I get all this in behind her nice and close so that there's no chance of her accidentally grabbing it with her arm. I'll give one final check here, tell her everything looks good, and then she'll give me a good loud count and then exits. Three, two, one. In this example, I had just finished the pin check and removed the jumper's pilot chute. It's a good illustration of how quick the setup can actually be, and it also shows very good communication between the both of us. Ready. Ooh, all right, I'm going to walk forward. Yep. All right, John. Ready. Three, two, one, see ya. <laughs> All right, that's it for part one of Bridal Awareness. The next video we're going to be talking about handheld where things are gonna start getting a little bit more complicated. So hope you enjoyed this one. See you next time.